All right. Uh, good evening. Everybody. Right, ladies and gentlemen, fellow engineers. My name is Dr. Sandra Popola, the chairman of the uh, Nigerian Society of Engineers, London branch. Today, like every other uh, Saturday, we have this uh, webinar, engineering webinar, that we've been, you know, started straight after the, uh, the first lockdown back in April. And this will be our 11th that we've run. And as a chairperson of uh, uh, NSC London, we uh, take it as our important uh, deliverable to, uh, to our fellow engineers across the world. So before we start, I would just like to make a couple of uh, event protocol that we need to follow today. Everybody will be muted when they come in. I've got my colleagues in the background. So if you don't mute yourself, you'll be automatically muted. Stop you from breathing. Uh, if you have any technical problem, please chat us in the background. We have three or four people looking at that that will help you to uh, solve the problem. If it's an audio or video, don't try and interrupt. Just give us a chat and then we'll be able to come and, and help you on that. And uh, question and answer during the uh, presentation. Again, please raise your question in the chat. Uh, during the question and answer, we may call upon you to uh, ask your question as well. Otherwise, we will be able to uh, ask your question on your behalf. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. webinar is recorded for mm -hmm. very, very good reason. We also have a record of what has been said. Mm -hmm. And also for those people who are not able to uh, join us today, to be able to gain by watching the, uh, the recording. And those of you here also, if you want to play back or if you want to forward the recording to other people, you're very happy to do so. I haven't seek permission from the presenter to be able to share his, uh, share his slides afterwards, but we'll, we'll seek for that uh, permission. But generally, the slides is only given to our members, London branch member who have paid to be part of this great organization. So if you're not a member, you could watch your uh, recording and you could come and join us as well, but you will not have access to the, uh, to the uh, slides. So those are the uh, protocol. Next, we need to acknowledge all the big guns in the house, starting from uh, engineer Mohamed Babangana, the chair, the president of NSC uh, in Nigeria. All the executive committee here present, council member of the every part of NSC, and all my colleagues here. The chairperson of all NSC branches, if you're here, you're very much welcome. Engineers, associates, and because we work so close with architects, we also acknowledge those architects. And everybody is. My sister is there. My son is listening because it's all about education. You're all welcome and we acknowledge you all. Right, so that's my, that's my little speech. But we'd like to tell you a little bit about NSC London branch. People have been accusing me of putting UK. So I'm gonna try and tone it down a bit. But I said, my, my, my answer to them, there's about 15 other places in the world called London. Yeah, so that's why I identify this London as London, UK, for those people who argue with me. Right, Theo. You're muted. Good afternoon, and um, I believe um, uh, Dr. P has done a very wonderful uh, uh, introduction there for every one of us. And um, as we always do, we have uh, a very wonderful uh, webinar ahead of us today. And uh, as usual, we have a, a very laudable uh, son of the uh, uh, of the soil, more or less, to speak, to come and talk to us. And um, NSC London UK, I will keep on using that London UK because, like he said, there are so many London. Even in Lagos, we have Osaka London, so we have to be very differentiated about that. So, so we've been uh, we've been around for quite some time, and uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of things for the past two years to be precise and like. Doctor said, "This is our eleventh webinar. We've been able to put together 
uh, a, a synergy between professionals of diverse natures. We've been able to put engineers uh, of different fields, both here in diaspora and in Nigeria together. We've been able to uh, have a cohesion of ideas and bring forth uh, situations whereby we can work together collaboratively. Also, the idea of um, NSC London UK branch is for us to uh, harness the wealth of experience that we have in the UK, the diaspora, to see how we can bring developmental growth, either in technology management and policy making back in Nigeria. And that is why you will see for the past 11 webinars, our speakers have always been varied in every uh, spectrum of, uh, of uh, uh, their uh, expertise. And today it's not different at all. Uh, also, definitely we look forward to having more people coming on board on, uh, to join us, us, as we are, uh, not even, we don't, we don't want to monopolize whatever we are doing here. We want everyone of, of Nigerian origin, even African origin, who wants to participate to come on board. And um, I'm going to uh, introduce one of our, my colleagues here who has come on board today. I just want him to say a word or two regarding the NSC with his experience. And um, I'll use the opportunity to welcome Chine Duahazu. Just say a word about NSC London UK branch. Over to you, Chinedu. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's so great to you know uh, be part of us. Um, I, I well, I grew up in Nigeria, um, studied in Nigeria, and um, I've I've been in the UK for a while now, learning and enjoying um, en um, engineering. And um, I'm, I'm at that stage where I'm so happy to be part of us and you know, share knowledge as well. Um, the NSC London um, UK branch, like um, Dr. P uh, just said, um, has been on for 2000, um, for two years now. So um, since 2018, um, it's one of four branches uh, in the UK and, um, oh, sorry, globally. And um, it's, it's, I think the first branch um, outside Nigeria, um, um outside nigeria so yes so we're we're a very very um diverse bunch uh like um uh, we've, we've just mentioned now and um yes so these seminars have gone on for a while and um I, i'm hoping that you know everyone here will continue to enjoy and be and participate as well and i'm um, looking forward to a great time so thanks everyone Thank you very much for that. And um, to more or less um, uh, show, give us a snapshot of what we as a, uh, as a body have been doing. Uh, we want to encourage some of our colleagues who have been able to put so much effort in doing something worthwhile in the areas of um, uh, endeavors. I just want to see if I can just share a screen for us to see uh, what we have used as our um, uh, Black History Month to celebrate uh, our engineers who have been not, able- not, not today, Tio. Not today, okay, that's fine. But definitely we want to really mention that we have got engineers amongst us who have been able to uh, dis more or less distinguish themselves in areas of their endeavors. And Dr. P is one of them. We know he's an erudite uh, member of the, of the engineering community in London. And we know that definitely he has been, he has been he at the forefront of um, so many, uh, he has been a pivotal uh, leadership uh, member of so many uh, areas of engineering, including this NSC London UK brand. And also we want to let us know as well that members of um, the diaspora here in terms of engineering have been co-opted twice this year to be involved in um, bringing up new talents on the platform of Nigerian sort of engineers in terms of regu regu regulation. So we've been involved in the interview sessions, online interview sessions twice this year. And that's a big, big, uh, big step for us that we have been involved to share our knowledge and ideas uh, with uh, our, our, our colleagues back home in Nigeria. Also, uh, this year also show we, we uh, Dr. Pupuala has been uh, on the forefront of giving a notable key address at the just concluded AGM meeting in Nigeria as well. So we can see definitely over the past two years we are making impact. And I believe the best is yet to come from every one of us. So to set the ball rolling today, I'm just going to kind of summarize by asking us 
that if we know of anyone in particular who has a passion for country Nigeria, who is quite interested in bringing developmental growth for the country via engineering, architecture, or any business, entrepreneurship, any area of endeavor in the diaspora, let's give them a shout. Let's give them a shout and get in touch with us, and then we can work together. And I believe this is a step forward. And uh, we are looking forward, by the, by the time the pandemic, maybe the, the, the curtain is rolled up and we are free to move around where we can come and meet, meet together physically. Uh, we can make um, laudable uh, trips back to Nigeria to showcase our seminars as well. So before that happens, we want to welcome you to our webinar, another lovely one today. And I'm going to uh, pass the baton on to Dr. Popola, who will now introduce our webinar speaker for today. Over you, Dr. P. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I've said today, today is another wonderful day for uh, this webinar. And uh, we were very fortunate that we have a very interesting speaker in the house. In the name of uh, Dr. Lawrence, I call him Larry. I call him. Dr. Lawrence Jones, a son. If I start reading all his uh, credentials, we're going to be in trouble today. FCMI, FHEI, MED, PhD, you know, PGC, you know, it just goes on and on. And I say, hey, stop, 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 stop. We don't need all of this. We can only, only, we only need four. So please, four is enough for today. We'll, we'll share the other one later on. So Dr. Jones Essan is a good friend of mine. He works at the University of Sunderland in the, in the business school there. And today, He's also a CEO of Lagos Academy Business School. We call it Labs. I'm also a, a director of that school. So I know Dr. Jones has some very well. But today is topic area, <clears throat> infusing knowledge management in higher education, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Engineer and Nigeria as a case study. So we're not just looking at education that we've got from the diaspora, but how do we then infuse that into our people back home and taking the sub-Saharan Africa, for example? How do we make sure we embed that knowledge, that fantastic knowledge? So Dr. Jones is, a, is an academic of strong international standing in computing, business, higher education management. He holds a PhD in international business manager from the St. John's University International School of Management. He also owes a postgraduate uh, qualification called PG, PG Diploma in Educational Leadership and Management. Master of Education from RMIT University in Australia. This guy's traveled so much. Postgraduate certificate uh, from Canterbury Christchurch University. Is a charter member of the Fellow of Professional Bodies, including the Fellow of Charter Management Institute, Fellow of uh, Charter Institute of Marketing, British Computer Society, Institute of Leadership Management. He is a member of London Chamber of Commerce and Industry. These are people that goes around the world and look for new things and then bring it down to London and trying to uh, make a very good of it. The Canadian Institute of Entrepreneur, the American Management Association called MAMA or MAMA or MAMA, and the fellow of the I Education Academy in the UK, FHEA. Dr. Joan is a lead lecturer and associate program leader at the University of Sunderland in London. They have a branch, although they call it University of Sunderland, but they can't operate in Sunderland, so they have a branch in London, yeah? At the Faculty of Business and Law, Dr. Joan is executive, uh, a, a executive Nigerian, is an entrepreneur, a business management consultant, information technology professional, and a certified IT trainer, yes, I can, I can believe that. When I have computer problem, I call on for him, and with his eye closed, he gives me the answer. He was part of a team who organized a trade mission to promote UK education around the world, including Dubai, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Ghana, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, and the only place they have, and Nigeria, the only place they haven't been to is Mass, and he's working on that. So with no further ado, I'm going to allow Dr. Jones to share his slides and take us through what he believes 
is, 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 it needs to be done, this infusing knowledge management into our, into our education system. So Dr. Larry, take it away. I'll stop sharing. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, today's webinar. I am privileged to be in the midst of erudite scholars, those who have made things happen. These are not just people who went to university to get knowledge, but they've used their hands to create things. But ladies and gentlemen, today's lecture will be one of the kind that I want you to take note of. It is going to be very interactive, but also I want you to see it at the end of the webinar that you have something that you want to do with either with the, uh, the engineers, um, Society of Engineers or yourself going to Nigeria or Africa to do something. So what is infusing knowledge management in higher education in Sub-Saharan Africa and using Nigeria as a case study? Let me begin by saying quickly that we have a lot to talk about. And I'm focusing this mainly on the engineers to start with. I'll come back to a few things in a minute. How exactly has engineering impacted society? Well, as you know, it was mentioned briefly by uh, Theo, engineer Theo. Engineering has made a tremendous impact on our society as a whole. Innovative ideas are at the heart of what engineers do. And they use their knowledge to create new and exciting prospects and solve problems that arises. In fact, I must say this to you, I wish you know already, engineers have completely changed the world that we live in. From modern homes, bridges, space travel, cars, and latest mobile technology. That has been the role that engineers have played over time in many countries, both developed and some developing country. And now we live in a global village, as you all know. We can communicate to any part of the world instantaneously. And this is not down to magic. This is the work of engineers. And this has been one of the things that we they pride themselves on. And we as business management students or gurus as they call us, appreciate the role of engineers. So my talk today is gonna to be based on around the, around the engineers. So why not a great deal of engineering work by Africans. That means there are quite a lot, but I want to point out a few things that is not there yet. Africa is a continent in the world having a population of over 1.11 billion people. The zone of this intensely populated landmass of 11.67 million square miles. And regarding the populace, this is the world's second biggest continent. 6% of the all out surface region of the earth is occupied by we Africans. And that is in itself a colossal amount of number. But the question is this, what can we literally associate with Africa? I mean, there are quite a lot of things, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to talk down on Africa, no. But I believe there's a lot that can be done. I mean, a quick memory lane, we have 54 nations in Africa. Why two is on that question? Africa is renowned everywhere, all over the world, and draws a good number of vacationers. And there are many astonishing places to visit in Africa. But how well do we promote these wild places? Wild Live Park in Africa are mainstream and are visited by numerous sightseers. For example, the Volcano National Park in Rwanda and Kruger National Park in South Africa. All of these places are places where people go and make money. Africa is likewise known for its seashells. For example, Noisy Bay in Madagascar and Dahab town in Egypt, an astonishing place to visit, of course. And Dahab is also known as a fishing town. Cape Town in South Africa is also one of the stunning places to live and study. Those are very important places. And as I as mentioned earlier on, health, the industry has hugely benefited from engineering. That is a good thing. Advances in medical technology is solely down to our engineers. We have some of them in the house today. And without doctors, without, the, without the, actually their role, doctors will not be able to you know, treat patients the way they do today. 
with fantastic success rate. They won't be able to do so. So engineering has essentially allowed us to understand the medical issues today and not to even mention other things that we do. Engineers are the reason for the phenomenal growth in technology of every generation They have been there. Just think about what the technological advances that are in our everyday lives today. Not only one can be you know, less associated with engineers. So there'll be satellites, machines that help us to understand the world the way we all live today. Those are the work of engineers. And we are so proud to have them. So associating with them in itself is a good thing. And not to mention communications or further development like steam engines, jet engines, airplanes, all down to everything we do is down to engineers. They've allowed businesses to work smarter and faster than ever. Improvement to travel have changed the way humans connect with another. Opening trades for businesses and allow people to travel literally all over the world. Within 24 hours, we can go from here within six hours, we're in Nigeria, not 24 hours. People can travel the whole world. How about space? Well, visiting space may be in, back in the days a mere dream in the past, but not anymore. The International Space Station is the largest and most complex science undertaking ever. And that is one of the things. It allows scientists, analysts, and engineers from all over the world to come together and conduct research that cannot be done elsewhere. And finding answers to queries that have been on question for years. This is down to engineers. But there are no aspect of the world we live in today that isn't affected by the work of engineers. So the great thing is engineering is continued to affect society in a great and beneficial way. But hey guys, let me quickly bring something back to your attention. Here are some of the list of top 10 best engineering universities in Africa. I'll start with the number one, University of Cape Town. Basically found in 1829. Selenbosch University, 1866. Cairo University, 1908. University of Pretoria, 2011. University of Witwatersrand, 1922. University of KwaZulu, Natal, 2004. University of Nairobi, 2002. American University of Cairo, 1919. University of South Africa, 1873. Mazara University, 1962. Ladies and gentlemen in the house today, as a Nigerian and a proud Nigerian, I haven't seen any university mentioned here that comes from Nigeria. So what is going on? What is wrong? What are we missing out on? Why are we not there? One of the questions I need to bother our mind. So Nigerian case study, as we said in this case, to engineers, higher education institutions are considered to be authority in the field of knowledge creation exploration and societal advancement. However, recent reports show that Nigerian universities are failing to prepare graduates for the developmental challenges of an emerging economy. The majority of graduates are ill-equipped to meet the demands of the labor market. No wonder, no list out of the 10 in Africa is actually there from Nigeria. According to Coralie Simon, QS, no Nigerian universities is in the top 1,000 globally, not even in the top 20 in Africa. That is questionable. And we're meant to be the heart, the giants of Africa. So what is wrong? What is going on? And we have lots of engineers around. Meanwhile, universities should be intellectual center of knowledge, production, energizing development of learning society. But for Nigerian university to be able to compete with the best in the world, we require access to knowledge. Consequently, effective implementation of knowledge management will reconnect the missing links to development and create an ecosystem that can foster rapid growth. That is why this lecture today is so important. Just for you to know, I'd like you to quickly spend a few minutes with me. Have a look at this quickly. Why we need to do something very, very quickly. Please watch this with me for a second. I need to share this.
Albert Einstein once said, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, today on trial we have modern day schooling. Glad you could come. Not only does he make fish climb trees, but also makes them climb down and do a 10 mile run. Tell me school, are you proud of the things you've done? Turning millions of people into robots, do you find that fun? Do you realize how many kids relate to that fish swimming upstream in class, never finding their gifts, thinking they are stupid, believing they are useless? Well, the time has come, no more excuses. I call school to the stand and accuse him of killing creativity, individuality, and being intellectually abusive. He's an ancient institution that has outlived his usage. So, Your Honor, this concludes my opening statement, and if I may present the evidence of my case, I will prove it. Proceed. Exhibit A. Here's a modern-day phone. Recognize it? Here's a phone from 150 years ago. Big difference, right? Stay with me. Here's a car from today, and here's a car from 150 years ago. Big difference, right? Well, get this. Here's a classroom of today, and here's a class we used 150 years ago. Now, ain't that a shame? In literally more than a century, nothing has changed. Yet you claim to prepare students for the future? But with evidence like that, I must ask, do you prepare students for the future or the past? I did a background check on you and let the record show that you were made to train people to work in factories, which explains why you put students in straight rows, nice and neat, tell them sit still, raise your hand if you want to speak, give them a short break to eat, and for eight hours a day, tell them what to think. Oh, and make them compete to get an A. A letter which determines product quality, hence grade A of meat. I get it. Back then, times were different. We all have a past. I myself am no Gandhi. But today, we don't need to make robot zombies. The world has progressed. And now we need people who think creatively, innovatively, critically, independently, with the ability to connect. See, every scientist will tell you that no two brains are the same. And every parent with two or more children will confirm that claim. So please explain why you treat students like cookie cutter frames or snapback hats, giving them this one size fits all crap. Watch your language. Sorry, Your Honor. But if a doctor prescribed the exact same medicine to all of his patients, the results would be tragic. So many people would get sick, yet when it comes to school, this is exactly what happens. This educational malpractice where one teacher stands in front of 20 kids, each one having different strengths, different needs, different gifts, different dreams, and you teach the same thing the same way? That's horrific. Ladies and gentlemen, the defendant should not be acquitted. This may be one of the worst criminal offenses ever to be committed. And let's mention the way you treat your employees. Objection. Overruled. I want to hear this. It's a shame. I mean, teachers have the most important job on the planet, yet they're underpaid? No wonder so many students are short changed. Let's be honest, teachers should earn just as much as doctors because a doctor can do heart surgery and save the life of a kid, but a great teacher can reach the heart of that kid and allow him to truly live. See, teachers are heroes that often get blamed, but they're not the problem. They work in a system without many options or rights. Curriculums are created by policymakers, most of which have never taught a day in their life just obsessed with standardized tests. They think bubbling in a multiple choice question will determine success. That's outlandish. In fact, these tests are too crude to be used and should be abandoned, but don't take my word for it. Take Frederick J. Kelly, the man who invented standardized testing, who said, and I quote, these tests are too crude to be used and should be abandoned. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if we continue down this road, the results will be lethal. I don't have much faith in school, but I do have faith in people. And if we can customize health care, cars, and Facebook pages, then it is our duty to do the same for education, to upgrade it, change it, do away with school spirit, because that's useless. Unless we're working to bring the spirit out of each and every student, that should be our task. No more common core. Instead, let's reach the core of every heart in every class. Sure, math is important, but no more than art or dance. Let's give every gift an equal chance. I know this sounds like a dream, but countries like Finland are doing impressive things. They have shorter school days. Teachers make a decent wage. Homework is non-existent, and they focus on collaboration instead of competition. But here's the kicker, boys and girls. Their educational system outperforms every other country in the world. 
Other places like Singapore are succeeding rapidly. Schools like Montessori, programs like Khan Academy, there is no single solution. But let's get moving. Because while students may be 20% of our population, they are 100% of our future. So let's attend to their dreams. And there's no telling what we can achieve. This is a world in which I believe. A world where fish are no longer forced to climb trees. I rest my case. You're muted. You need to go back to your previous slides. You need to yep. share the slides. Yeah, definitely. Just one second. Before I do that, I quickly want to um, ask you, as an audience, looking at the video, that you just watch, just going back, what do you think? Let me draw something out quickly. It says what 20% of our society might be children, but they are 100% of our future. Let me quickly make this very clear. In Nigeria alone, we have probably over 202 million people. Yet 60% of that population are youth, not 20%, 60%. That is a huge amount of numbers. And that currently is not doing us any favor. And we believe we need to do something. And if we don't have a list of our university that at this level, then something is not right. If you put together 100 students who are from Nigeria and ask them, what have you studied? They tell you, mass come and beside me. Mass come and beside me. What is happening with engineering? But there are a lot of engineers out there of course, but the point is this, what can we, what do we have to show? For many of us who are engineers who have left Nigeria, who have come down here, have done so much. And I believe there's a lot that needs to be done. Nigeria has one of the largest population in terms of youth. And with a population of over 220, uh, 202 million people, about half the size of West Africa population, according to World Bank in 2020. So engineering is a discipline mainly consists of innovation as it is concerned with creation, design, building, and maintenance of use and use of engineer engines, machines, and infrastructures. So engineering education contributes significantly to economic development, economic growth, national development, and even building a nation as a whole. So current trends in engineering education in Nigeria has created a disparity, so to say, between the quality of training received by the graduates in Nigeria and other developed country. Before we go any further, please, why I think engineers in the house today need to think twice as to what they need to do. Please watch this quickly. Um, just gonna share this with you quickly as well. Just one second, I need to share this. Because you need to be planning what we need to do to capture the market and the soul of Africa. Can you see this, please? It's like yours. And 90% of them are more likely to visit if you have photos online. If you think Wakanda was just a fiction movie and can never occur in real life, then wait, as this is about to change for the first time in history after the launch of the Wakanda City of Return project in Ghana. The Wakanda City of Return project has been officially launched in Ghana, and the project is expected to be a legacy of Ghana government's year of return and beyond the return tourism initiatives. Officials of Ghana and the city of Cape Coast has signed a memorandum of understanding with the African Diaspora Development Institute ADI, and two local companies to pave way for the creation of an ultra-modern smart city to be known as the Wakanda City of Return. The partners for the multi-billion project desire to create a place of pilgrimage for the people of African descent, as well as other tourists to know about the history, culture, the civilization of Africa, and its role in the creation of the new world economy. 
The ultra-modern edifice modeled around the architecture of the Wakanda city as exhibited in the famous Black Panther movie is expected to attract many across the globe to Ghana. It will also be a center for teaching the history of the black race. The building of the city is in line with the many tourist sites in the region which attract a lot of foreigners. The city of Cape Coast in Ghana's central region is widely known as the nation's tourism hub and the Mecca for African descent in the diaspora. Every year, thousands of black people across the world visit the city and other historic slave sites to learn about the transatlantic slave trade. The region was the hotbed of the slave trade that saw millions of Africans uprooted to the New World. The coastal region has a number of castles and dungeons that were used to keep enslaved men and women for days before they were transported to the Americas to work on various plantations. The Wakanda City of Return is set to change the coastlines of Cape Coast with the construction of five-star hotels, heritage walkway, retreat and health resort, conference centers, and the continental corporate headquarters of African Diaspora Development Institute. Her Excellency Ambassador Erikana Chambori Kwao, the former African Union representative to the United States and the president of African Diaspora Development Institute, praised Honorable Ernest Arthur, the mayor of What I wanted to show in that video was to see what is about to take place in Ghana. I hope the dream will come to fruition, but it would need loads of engineers, loads of skilled laborers. We don't really need to be inviting foreigners to come and help us out with all of this kind of project. Akon City, also in Tanzania, is about to be built as well. Engineers will be needed so we can actually have cross country alliance with most of this project. And I'm sure Nigeria have a lot. Dangote is building one of the best, one of the most incredible refinery in Lagos, Lekki area. And engineers are coming from India. Of course, we have Nigerians who are part of it, but we're not probably playing the major role as we should be, we should be doing. That is why it's important for us to think of some of those things that we're talking about. With an abundance of natural resources, Nigeria is Africa's biggest oil exporter and has the largest natural gas reserve on the continent, according to World Bank 2020. And the output in terms of innovation in Nigeria is way below par as compared to other countries. The Global Innovation Index, GII, pointed to the slow growth of innovation in Africa largest economy, Nigeria. That's what we're so concerned, is the largest economy in Africa. The Global Index, Innovation Index, also ranked world economies according to their innovative innovations and capabilities. No wonder our universities are not among those 10 best in Africa yet. Consisting of roughly 80 indicators grouped into innovation input and output. Nigeria was ranked 117 out of 130 one countries in 2019. Locally, Nigeria is ranked 15th among the 26 economies in Sub-Saharan Africa. The index shows Nigeria's economy performed below expectations when compared with the level of economic growth global index, global innovation index. The report of just 2020 is there. So we now see why engineers and engineering education need to be massively improved. Let me quickly remind you quickly, guys, I'm sure you know this. Benefit of engineering to the economy of Nigeria would be the country has been faced with challenges of stable electricity, electricity, electricity for, for a long time. Engineers need to explore renewable sources of over, over, uh, to overcome this acute power shortage. Without power in any country, there's no way business can thrive. Majority of the small businesses are spending a lot of money on generators. And that being the case, that has crippled and is crippling many businesses. Engineers are the main players in the construction and infrastructure uh, uh, space, so to say. Building of roads, bridges, buildings, airports, and harbors, these are work of engineers. 
But majority of the time, some of this money are spent by importing others to come into the country. Now Chinese is taking over, or they have actually taken over. And what are we doing? Majority of us are probably are in a comfort zone. For a country not to be important, relevant manufacturing activities needed to accelerate its, its, its growth would depend on engineering. So manufacturing, infrastructure development, power generation are three main areas as identified that we can basically use to develop our economy and develop that country. And if Nigeria get itself together, obviously we can lead the way and Africa could be a great continent and as it should be, but we're not doing so. So why am I introducing today knowledge management? What is knowledge management? Well, knowledge management involves the people, process, culture, and enabling technology necessary to capture, manage, share, and find information. That's true. But many people think knowledge management is about IT, a repository of information. Is that the case? Well, let's just quickly define what is knowledge management, just to kind of bring it to bear. According to Tom Davenport, he says, and I quote, knowledge management is a process of capturing, distributing, and effectively using knowledge. That was way back in 1994. Then we have Gartner, who also made his uh, view known, which says, and I quote, knowledge management is a discipline that promotes an integrated approach to identifying, capturing, evaluating, retrieving, and sharing all of an enterprise information asset. And this asset may include databases, documents, policies, procedures, and previously uncaptured expertise and experience in the individual workers. That is their definition. And you agree with me, that need to be put in place. Because if we do things, if you garbage in, you garbage out. If there's no plan in place, that will make it very uncomfortable and unrealistic for us to achieve our goal. So I put together these six drivers as part of my PhD thesis, organizational culture, leadership, information technology, reward mechanism, social capital, and performance management. Those six drivers, if these six drivers are managed effectively, we can get a very beautiful output. First, development of more relevant policies, increase consistency in our decision-making, improve procedures and processes, and that is what we need to try and concentrate on. Create trust culture for knowledge sharing. Because many organizations today, those who are leading, are not willing to share their experiences. Why? So they think they're going to lose their job. They think if they share their experience with other people, they might lose their job. And they think they come first. Not the country, not where they work. Many of them are working to protect themselves because there's no trust. So we need to find ways to overcome this. And this is another, this could be dissected and talked a lot about in the future to kind of see how this can work for education in Nigeria and also the society of engineers. Create awareness of te for technology, create lobbying group for IT infrastructure, make IT an enabler for knowledge sharing, and recognize IT as infrastructure storage and not knowledge management. Because many people think when we say, oh, Google is knowledge management, not at all. And I'll explain why that is not the case. Enhance support for retention and promotion, better succession planning, implementation need to be put in place. Let me give you an example. Some of us are Nigerian. Udutola Tayas, he died, no succession planning. His dream died with him. Fajemi Rokun, he died, his dream also died with him. Nothing is left behind. Bobby Benson, he died, that's it, he was gone. So all of this are effects of lack of knowledge management center being in place where we can tap into and help people to understand creating succession planning using knowledge management would be a better thing for all of us. Well, here is what I call knowledge management life cycle. How do we create knowledge? We need to understand what is tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. But again, I am not going to talk too much about all of this today, but at least giving you an understanding of what it is like, and we'll make this available so you can read. I don't want to bore you too much on those things, but if you ask questions, we can talk about them. 
And that is why knowledge sharing is so key. And that will come on the, the social communication infrastructure where people can. Back in the days when I was growing up in school, when I'm asked to do certain things, I cover it up because I don't want anybody else to copy me. But hey, what I was covering up then is actually available on Google today. The question was, how do we survive without Google? So knowledge has been shared, but there are some knowledge that cannot be shared on Google, which is in itself tacit and explicit. And how we do that is by trusting each other and working together. And that is what it is actually helping us to see. So good engineers are in born. They are made. Over the course of their career, engineers made decisions about design and consequently learn from them. And as a result, their decision-making always come the way they want it to be. If it's not, then they can improve on them. But in contrast, organization, collective decision-making doesn't always improve in itself, in itself. but indeed it, it rises as engineers learn and degrade as an engineer's lead. What I'm trying to say in that respect is that if we allow explicit knowledge to take root in what we do and share information and pass it on to people without being afraid we might lose our job, that could really make a whole lot of difference. So to improve organization, decision-making quality, engineering managers should search for ways to capture and leverage past design experiences and able to share it. But where did they actually store those things? You find out the way one problem is solved might not be the same way another one will be solved. But if there are no way in which you can capture those information, that will make it even more difficult. Therein lies the genesis of engineering knowledge management, which is a strategy to capture explicit and tacit design knowledge for reuse in product development. So how can we reuse our experiences? We must have way to capture information and store them, but able to use them when we need to. So knowledge management for engineers, we say the aim of the knowledge management are to understand and capture storage and retrieval of engineering design knowledge. That's one. Two, to understand decision-making in engineering design and the nature of design expertise. And to develop theories that can form the basis for new methods and tools. Because if we keep doing the same thing the same way over and over again and expect different results, then we are in, in a serious trouble. As you saw in that video, I've sued the education system. Look at what has happened over time. But are we changing the same way we do things in Nigeria or in South Saharan Africa? Maybe not. Do we need to improve on that? Yes. But some people need to make that move. As they say, a small group of committed individuals can change the world. Take, for example, US have over 330 million people, but they have over 5,000 universities that they are proud of, and the names are known, renowned all over the world. Nigeria, in the, on the other hand, have 202 million people, but only have 174 universities. In ratio terms, you can imagine. And those universities are ill-equipped to train students for tomorrow. And we are expecting that we should have students who graduate in Nigeria to be able to compete with other engineers or students anywhere else in the world. So to develop and test a prototype method, we need tools to do that. But most of the time, they're not available. Even practice, practical in, in universities are a problem. Imagine someone who said, I'm a graduate of a computer science, BSc computer science, and I've never used computer in the class, always standing by the window to make notes. And that is itself no one will not help any one of us. So to just break it down, what are we talking about in terms of knowledge? Well, here, here are some of the type of knowledge that we're talking about today. Explicit knowledge, implicit and tacit. And just for those who will have access to the slide, they can look at it carefully. But I'll just talk about one of them. Explicit knowledge can be articulated. Once articulated, it can be represented as information it is written down and thus store externally or transfer to somebody else. Example of this is the factual descriptions of a process or product that could be shared and introduced to new people. And of course, the rest are the same implicit and tacit knowledge. But I think I should mention the tacit knowledge one, which is knowledge that cannot be, by definition, be articulated, but it is its role in the design process can be investigated. Example of that is 
knowledge, uh, tacit knowledge is the intuitive feeling that an experienced designer has for the correct shape of a component in a, in a product. An experienced person can say, well, I see that is five by four, 12 by 10, 12 by 11. They can see it because they've been there, they've done it before. And those are not things you can teach anyone. But of course, you can communicate that to people where you can use it for your own experience. That is why it's important. But then we have to find a way to basically find a way to transfer knowledge between organizations and engineers. That is why I think to talk a bit about implicit knowledge is quite important. The practical application of implicit knowledge is spark a conversation and be able to pass the skill from one person to the other. And that is one is important, important about implicit knowledge. And I think it's important. So how can a university as a knowledge-based institution infuse knowledge management in the operation? Well, knowledge management is one of the strategies designed to tackle various challenges which modern tertiary institutions are facing. Tertiary institutions are no longer expected to live and operate in isolation or in silos. No, because a knowledge-based institution manages knowledge is a very critical thing for them. Being able to manage it is critical of their own staff and also of the student they produce. The university as a knowledge-based institution are expected to manage knowledge for sustainable competitive advantage, growth and innovation in Nigeria. But is that happening enough? Well, I'll leave you to answer that question. So knowledge management practices may differ, of course, from one university to another, depending on who is managing it. The majority of those who are appointed as vice chancellors in Nigeria are appointed politically, and they have different reason why they're there. They have to answer to their bosses. And that makes it very difficult to have a competitive university that's producing the right people, the right student, the right graduate. That's one of the things we need to kind of think about. So ways of infusing knowledge management into higher education, curriculum need to be redesigned. I've been advocating for curriculum decolonization. How do we decolonize our curriculum? Imagine someone who is coming to London, for example, to do marketing. Marketing in the UK is completely opposite to the way we market in Nigeria. Yet we teach the same curriculum that is taught in the UK because what was left behind by the colonial master is always still teaching. I'm advocating that we need to rewrite our own script, rewrite things that will actually benefit Nigeria University, Nigeria environment from today. And we need to do that. And only these guys, I believe engineers have a society that can basically make things to start happening. So education is important, but curriculum is so important. Higher education need to redesign their own management, uh, knowledge management center, because in South Africa, they have one. In, in Kenya, they have one. In Mauritius, they have one. And they're leading. Right now, robots is actually controlling traffic in Rwanda. But Nigeria, what's actually happening? We don't even have light to actually pass our traffic light. That's one of the issues that we have. So university need to also connect with industry, not just teaching an abstract su subject that doesn't correlate with the industry that, we, that, we, that we, we actually believe in. So there need to be relationship between organization and universities. And that is important to do that, to promote creativity among our young people. And that will help because majority of those people, I mean, I think it was Saludo who said this, 70% oh, of our graduates are unemployable unemployable, 70%. No, I've actually not, uh, I've not confirmed that data, but that's what he said. That 70% of our graduates are unemployable because majority of them cannot even fill out a form completely without error, which is in itself a very sad state of affair. So engineers have a duty here because you're more, more or less the backbone of every, any nation. So there's a need for us to wake up and do things differently. And our teaching method also need to change. Rather than asking professors, I mean, of course, don't get me wrong, they are very good in their own way. But for example, take, take, take for example, a professor teaching entrepreneurship, which is not in their own field. It's one of the things we do. Every one of us do things that is not actually our own core area. Somehow we're not honest enough to own up to it. This is not my area of expertise. And I think that's very, very important for us to know. And that's, those are the things we would like engineers in Nigeria to think about and see how they can 
make things happen, change the narrative, change the face of things. And I believe that can happen with the group of people that we have in the house today, that would definitely happen. And as I mentioned earlier on, a small group of committed individual can and will change the world. But those people must be willing to do today what others will not do so they can have tomorrow what the rest of the world will not have. I'll leave you with that. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Larry Jones, you've, uh, you've definitely infused me. I don't know about everybody else on the uh, platform, but you've definitely infused me. I mean, those uh, videos that you show, are you taking us back to historical things? I mean, you said that my, my phone 200 years ago, uh, sorry, 20 years ago on my phone now, you could see fantastic development. Yeah? Our car, the same thing. And then you look back and you look at the classroom and nothing has changed. How wicked can we be that we haven't thought about, you know, teaching and uh, impacting knowledge differently for over 300 years? So thank you, thank you very much for that. It's, it's really, really amazing. It's interesting conversation. So I'm just going to try and uh, open things up to our colleagues here to uh, to uh, to ask some questions. I can't see any question on the chat at the moment. I know they are coming. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll call you to ask your question. Any questions there? I mean, everybody just giving you a, a pat on the back. It's a fantastic presentation, Dr. Jones. And uh, this is this is a definitely a different way of looking at uh, education or impacting knowledge management into our into our education system. So, uh, but for me, a question for you: As you are in education, you you teach, you infuse, you do all that kind of thing. What do you think if you're if you're the president of Nigeria tomorrow? No, no, not even president. You know, I mean, that, that's too small for you. If you're if you're minister, <laughs> minister of education for Nigeria tomorrow, what is the first thing you will do? I know there'll be hundreds of things. What's the first thing you will change to, to, to try and get us going? Thank you, Dr. Popola. And I'm sure majority of us, uh, without with all due respect, were taught by grade two teachers. Back in the days, educate um, teachers. Uh, those who are not well paid, well looked after. I think one of the things I'll first and foremost change would be to recognize the position of, 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 of teachers. Just imagine what um, uh, Prince E.A. said. If doctors prescribe the same medicine for sick people, just the same way for everyone, there will be loads of dead people on the street. But why should uh, you know, lecturers be treated the same way like everyone else? And not only that, and teach the same way they teach. I mean, we have um, a society of, of teachers in Nigeria. But when, you, when you look at what happened in Kaduna recently, uh, Erufai actually sent basic questions to our teachers in Kaduna. Majority of them failed. Why? Because those who who basically are teaching in, 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 in our institutions are those who couldn't get into the mainstream education. And they took up grade two teachers and they're the ones teaching people who will become graduates. Of course, not in all cases, but in most cases that was the case. So I will first and foremost re-address the teacher education system. I spent some time in Singapore, about seven weeks in Singapore. You cannot believe, but please, if you want, if you, there's a video that is, is called Why Education Work in Singapore. I will encourage everyone on this platform to watch that video. Why Education Work in Singapore. It's a beautiful, brilliant video. And it shows how government spends 60% of their budget on teacher education. Teachers need to be trained, need to be taught. That is why if you don't have a list of our university on the list of best universities, you come down to a lot of things. One of the first thing is teachers. So I, as a person, 
will come and revamp the teaching education system in Nigeria. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Engineer Shinedu, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? I, I, I have to um, ask, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the question really is... We can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, it's very quiet. It's very low. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Still very low, but we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the question I have is, um, how, how do we promote original thinking um, in our engineering sector in Nigeria. And um, the, the reason I ask and um, I, I ask is, for instance, in entertainment, in entertainment, the Nigerian entertainment industry, Stella, you know, um, um, changed jazz into Afrobeat. And right now, um, um, the younger ones using Afrobeats are leading the world because no one can beat Nigerians in Afrobeats. And you can see a lot of the young people, Whiskey and all those young people, they are, they are, they are doing very, very well because like your presentation said, um, you know, they're, they're winning in their own game. But now um, in the engineering sector, we still are very, um, intimidated and it's not to say that we don't we possibly don't have um original thinking in our you know in our dna but how do we stir this original thinking up how do we you know bring or, or um, raise fellas that will take for instance jazz music and create something entirely different a whole new genre and that young people can begin to own the music uh, or rather own the engineering and um, actually contribute to the world. How do we start? Thank you, Chinedu. That's a very brilliant question. I've always talked about this in some of my lectures, but there's a program I developed and I think it's important that we think about it, cultural adaptation program. Let me start by saying, by using that, by explaining what I meant by it culture adaptation program. If you are an expert in simply brick lane and you are from Rivers, the man in the South, in Yoruba or in the North, will probably not want to use your skills because you're not from his own place. So that is one thing. And without getting over some of those issues of tribal issues to start with, is a problem. But then again, what I also meant by that is, if I'm able to speak to Dr. Wukwala, who is an Ausa man, I'm able to speak to engineer Chinedu, who is a river man, and I'm Yoruba, and we work together, and we draw out funds to develop programs that could help young people. Among us, there are no trust, because first and foremost, I'm not sure if we're meant to be living together as Nigerian, or as one. So that is one of the things that we need to kind of find a way to circumvent, to find a way to work together without thinking he is Igbo, he is Hausa, he is Yoruba. As a result, we can work together. And you find out if I, if I, I become a, gov a government or a president of Nigeria, I want to do things to please my own part of the country. So, and that in itself is creating, or even try as much as possible not to put people from other part in a very good position because I want to make sure that I'm protected. And that is one of the things I believe we need to change as part of our constitution because this is not gonna happen if we don't actually look from the top sometime. This is not something we can change easily, but we can't locally. I mean, also I, I'm open to corrections on this or perhaps you know, a different opinion, but I want to say that if we can work with the government and have the government to help to change the way things are put together, that can help because without that being the case, major project will fail. Let me give you an example of uh, Edurome. In this country, if you're an academics, you can travel to any part of UK and use Edurome to connect to a university network and you'll be fine. 
when that same project was meant to be implemented in Nigeria, bureaucracy and what goes in, what, what do I, what, what I get as a person, the back, the, 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 um, the backhand, whatever they call it, the bribes that I need to get. If I don't get the correct bribe, and then I'll make sure I block the progress of that project. And that has happened. Now, I think um, a company in Nigeria is doing well in that respect, and they've done quite, a well, quite well, but still having issue. Those are things I believe need to work. We need to work together, trust each other. And that could be taught. We could actually teach those cultural adaptation programs, try to see how we can work together and develop trust among ourselves. Without trust, it's difficult to work together. And also nepotism, favoritism is another issue. It doesn't matter who know what is, you know best. If it's not from my area, forget about him. That is a problem. So again, there's a lot we need to do together as engineers. And for example, this kind of forum, we should look at people, not only from Nigeria, as engineers in Nigeria, we should also try to relate to other engineers in other parts of Africa to come together. And this is NSC, Nigerian set of engineers. But we know those who are in Kenya, those who are in South Africa, can we work together? That is how we can build a whole continent and being able to work together. That would be my answer to that. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Larry. Uh, Miss Alison Ann, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? It's protocol. Alison, you want to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I was just curious about the point made about Rwanda and some other countries. What have those other African countries done that is so different from what's happening in Nigeria? You may have already just answered it in your previous reply though. Okay, what, what, what they have done, I mean, Rwanda is a, is a classic case study. You, any, any, any Nigerian should try and visit Rwanda. There was, uh, I mean, we, we know of the genocide that happened to Rwanda recently. I mean, when Hutus and Tutsis were basically killing each other, according to what they said, the report, but we know what happened. But they've learned a lot from that. And that country has taken off big time. Technology-wise, they're doing very, very well. And one of the things that is basically helping them is the leader in that country is not basically leaning on one side or the other side. Unlike ours, where we all fight to be, Northerners have to rule at one point, South has, Southerners have to rule at another point. But for example, let me say this, and I'll say, please forgive me if, if, I, if, if I offend anyone. I think the Igbos have been marginalized a great deal. And it in itself, they're very smart guys in Igbo land. I think they're not, not being given a fair, fair treatment. And I've seen when people are appointed into government, they are, they look at names of people that are there and that has not helped. The current administration itself, you can see, just look at those who are in, in a big, big position, where they're from. But I think all of this thing contributes to how things have been done in that country. Of course, they're small, don't get me wrong. I mean, those countries we're talking about, Rwanda, I mean, um, Mauritius, for example, just about 1.125 population wise, 1.125 million people. And Seychelles, just eight around fifty, you know, thousand people, and they do, they can manage that. I mean, UK we're talking about is only one state in Nigeria, so we have thirty six states. Our current constitution doesn't really help us, as far as I'm concerned. Thirty six states, one state is bigger than UK. For one person to manage that with the way we have currently are, it's not helping us. I think that needs to be looked into, and I'll, I'll leave those who are. Uh, po political science student to, to deal with that aspect. And I'm sure Dr. Kukula can help me with that. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Larry. I think you're campaigning for 2023, yeah. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> uh, Engineer Tio, can you ask your question, please? Uh, th th thank you very much, Dr. P. And uh, Dr. Larry, thanks for just uh, an insightful um, uh, session there. And um, I think um, it, I need to say this, it, it just kind of, it 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 homes in on what um, 
I am more or less putting together in my own nine to five job at the moment, whereby we've discovered that in project management, we're always having uh, our contractors having problems with the design after we have given them the contract award. So that gives us so much problem. So what we are doing now is um, I've initiated a process of ECI. ECI means early contractors involvement, whereby before the award is given to them, they have an input into the design and whatever we want to do before we give them the contract. And um, a critical part of that particular ECI is what we call service design, whereby they are part and parcel of the, 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 the design process. How can KM, knowledge management, help service design in that particular aspect? Wow. And it's just very good at, I mean, thank you, Thea, Engineer Theo. I happens to teach project management at the University of Sunderland as well. So um, I'm an electric, electric, electrical engineer to start with before I jump into management. My God. What you've mentioned, uh, one of the things that one need to, to, to do. I actually say uh, um, PID document is very important to have. That is basically making sure when you do your WBS, work breakdown structure, where you know what you're going to do and how you're gonna do it, it's better to actually have engineers to come in from the, from the start, for them to be aware of what's going on. Otherwise, at the, when they start the project, you find that they can shift the goalpost yeah. I actually say to everyone, once you give a brief of what needs to be done, please make sure you sign a contract with the client. Both of you have a copy. I'm not even saying sign just the last copy. Sign every page of the, of the, of the brief so that when they go, anything that changes, they know. And if you want to move the goalposts, when you come back, then we have to have a meeting again. And then if we need to add, reappraise, and renegotiate, we can do that. But that's one of the things I think what you're doing is actually quite right. But are we doing that currently? Let me use the word back home in Nigeria. We work together. No. If we then have to, if you find somebody who's, who's a bricklayer who is only a carpenter, want to do the job of both carpenter and bricklayer together, rather than having a specialist do the same job. I also will say something to you metrics, measurement, I think. I mean, I don't know if you've seen some building that is built in Nigeria, you see them, you know, leaning on one side. If you go to Togo or Kuton, you bring in a very, very good technician and they do it cheaper as well, but they're very, very good back in the days. So also I would say we engineers in the UK need to find a way to bring some engineer back home from Nigeria for what we call induction, to do things here to see how things are done. And uh, because we, I mean, for example, we go to Central Bank of Nigeria, FRS, to do short, short courses to, you know, with people. And I'm happy to have divine Phibs in the house today from FCDA, Federal Capital Territory. Welcome, welcome on board. Basically, Thank we go you. to the organization and to work with them, to help them see how to improve on the operation. But most engineers, I don't know if they have that kind of training. So I wonder if engineer at Ukwala could initiate through the London Academy Business School and others to provide an enhancement program, more like a CPD to help grow the businesses in Nigeria or engineers in Nigeria. So I believe yeah, that's what I would that, say. That's, that's one of the programs we're working on, as you know, for the new year. When the new executive comes on board, they're gonna, they're gonna run, they're gonna kick the ground running with a lot of program that we're setting up. It's like, it's like Obama preparing for Biden four years ago. Right. Okay. Engineer Shegun Marty, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, now. Uh, my question is relating to uh, the reality on ground in Nigeria. Mm. Is engineering really a rewarding profession in the sphere of the youth? Looking at what you find around yourself and the end time results of a particular line of study in the country. And you say engineering is actually a pivot for development. And this is not being seen by the youth as a rewarding uh, career. How do we change this uh, mindset within the country? That is the main thing that we have to start from. Like, unlike gone back in the years when engineers can be seen as really pivots to 
and then, and then you can go into this profession, study it, and come out and be part of the growth of the country. It's, I, I mean, uh, and Lamina could see probably is the reverse case now. And that's why you said now you see most people studying business and tech and mean? all the rest. Right? Does that mean, yeah. And engineering. Yeah, that's just my comment. We need to find a way of changing that to get more people into engineering at the youth level, young stage. Thank you, sir. I think you, you've, you've made a very, very good point. Uh, Engineer Popola recently brought in a lady uh, in Lagos State who is currently, I think, is uh, doing some work. Uh, I'm not sure what, what she, I mean, she's uh, doing, I think, what, um, Director of Works and Development or something like that. And she actually developed. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do it. It was actually Shegun that, that uh, arranged all of that. The guy okay. that just spoke now, he was the one that arranged all of that. Yeah. Okay, so can you just remind me what, what she did again, what she was what she was working on? Uh, that was, was can you give us a... Yeah, that, that, that's my principal actually present in Lagos, Nigeria. Okay. She's a special advisor to the Lagos State Governor on okay. roads and infrastructure. Wonderful. So... And what she worked on is, what she spoke on the webinar is the state of Lagos, past, present and future of what Lagos is, especially on road infrastructure development. And we, when, when she presented, we saw quite a lot of opportunity on what she spoke about, where I think engineers can come together and basically find a way to get funding to actually address one of the issues. I think she mentioned something about drainages in Lagos, which is a very, very big issue. That is what is affecting our roads because when it rains, our drainages are not basically working well. And that is one of the issues. But how many engineers are really actually out there? Yeah, because I think what she, one, one of the things she mentioned was that if we have the skills, we can come together and approach the government and to see what they would do. But most governments in Nigeria, they would tell you they don't have a huge amount of money. So could that be how a way of raising money and people working together? That is one of the things I could think about that can we work together as, an as, a, as, a, as a unit, create a group of people who believe this is one thing we can do. I mean, if you look at what, ha what happened in India, a young man put together a group of people, they were cleaning dirt from their rivers. And they basically, when they started doing it, they started getting funding from people. So if we see, of course we can speak to government because these are huge in a project. But if we get a group of people together to work together and present a program to the government and showcase their, 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 their skills, I'm sure it can happen. Because if we say we're not going to, we, I mean, uh, Todd Milan Bridge is currently closed. Please find out who is working on them, Chinese and others. Baja, we know what, they, what they're doing in Nigeria. They have Nigerians there, don't get me wrong, but what role are we playing? Bring that BRICS bring that tools, bring that, we just like liberals. The real core people are those foreigners. And this is why we need to change the narratives. And I believe it's important we do that. So for some of us who are not able to do well in engineering, it's just the, 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 uh, the, the, the labs, we don't have them. I mentioned that in my, in my slide. There's nowhere to practice. But I must say this, Elizabeth University in, in, in Laramoki, I went there with uh, Chief Mondi Ojo, when you saw what that man put down together in Ilaramoki, it's a state of the arts, both engineering and medicine. It's a beautiful place, but where it's located in Ilaramoki is a way, way out of sight. That's what I'm concerned. But I think if that is promoted, but those in, uh, lecturers who are also going to be teaching there also need to be okay. up to the task. Because I remember when I, I employed about 20 lecturers in Lagos, where we have about 2,500 2, students from the uh, NYIC. They were reading textbooks to our students in the class, textbooks. I basically went to the classroom and sat at, like a student. The lecturer was reading textbook and when we asked him questions, he simply said, just write it down, I'll speak to you after the class. And that was never the case. So. We ourselves, the engineer that we're talking about, need to be ready to teach those young people. Because if you don't know what you're teaching them, for example, IT these days, 
those who are teaching it themselves are not very good at it. So I think we need to improve ourselves. It need to be an, a cons concerted effort by the sort of engineers to make sure those who are actually teaching in those places are co co um, constantly improving themselves and getting recertificated most of the, every, every year for them to be able to practice in that environment. I think it's important. That is why you get students uh, more uh, interested in that subject. Like farming, mechanized farming will probably bring a lot of people into it. Young people will not go in there the way it is these days. Only old people and probably poor people will do farming. But we, that's a huge area that we're neglecting. So also is engineering. So it's the way the people that teach it that will make the, 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 the way forward or create the opportunity for those young people. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's very, very thought-provoking uh, question and answer. Uh, architect uh, Sululola, please unmute yourself and ask your question. And that will be the last question I'm going to take. Architect Sululola, are you there? Uh, let me ask him to unmute. Okay, okay, okay. I, I'll mute already. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Larry Jones. I do thank much you. Uh, appreciate your insight, students, in this um, uh, topic, knowledge management. But my question is, how far do you think Nigeria has failed in this core area? I will tip in that uh, the, 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 the organization's uh, culture to Core knowledge management is down because of our present leadership. And will you think it's better for Nigeria to split at this particular time to enable engineers, architects, lecturers, or whatever to move on to this stage of uh, knowledge management? Well, thank that's you. A very, that's a very political answer question. I will, I will, I will let uh, Dr. Larry answer that. I will say splitting up is not the answer. And to that, uh, so let's just leave the splitting up aside. What we can do that I believe that, that can work is that, for example, if only just let's talk about Lagos, the sort of engineers in Lagos can create an opportunity to invite not even if you are from the north, you are from the south, you are from the east, but you're very good engineers. They come together and start to create opportunity for themselves in that country. You find out the government will not be able to stop them. Because I believe society, that's why I said a group, a small group of committed individual can change the world. A very small group can change the world. But those individual, must be willing to do today what others would not do. They will have to take some risk that others would not take for them to be able to get their work done. Because it's important if we keep thinking that until we split, we know we came together by, by, by cohorts, as I would say, it's not, I mean, by force, more, more, more or less, but we've been together for over, you know, some years now, over 60, 60 years. And that being the case, we should continue to see how we can do that. So let's not bring separation as a topic right now. Let's talk about how can we improve what we currently have? How can we improve Lagos? I mean, look at Dangote. I'm sure Dangote is not from Lagos, but it's building one of the most incredible refinery in Lekki area, in Lagos state. And of course, that will benefit people from the South. And there are also some others that is being built in Niger, at the border of Niger or Mali are from Nigeria. So engineers need to see how they can harness the skill they have. And I'm sure we can talk to um, Dr. Popola on how to see that one thing is done and is done correctly. That is building laboratories in university, universities. Our universities are ill-equipped when it comes to laboratories. They're not there. So what can you teach students with? If those things are not there, it's hard to actually progress. So Splitting, let's leave that aside. Let's talk about how we can improve teaching our students, our young people, the right way and with the right tools. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on that note, we're gonna stop the uh, question and answer.
Dr. Larry, you've been fantastic. A couple Thank of uh, supportive messages on chat, which you can you can read at your own time. People who have come from Nigeria to work here and they see the big difference that even though they were not originally from here, they'll see how they managed to fit into the system very easily compared to any of us going back and, and trying to fit in in the middle of all the uh, all the all the problem and also make reference to the uh, the ENSA protest. It says that, uh, you know, his ENSA is more or less died down now. And uh, the politician are gonna start working on those young people to make sure they vote for them again in 2023. So that's just a, a personal comment in there. So thank you. Before we give a final vote of tank, which engineer, engineer Tio is gonna do, I'm just going to announce a couple of other things that the uh, uh, the group have before Christmas. So I know Christmas is coming when we're all going to take a break from uh, uh, coronavirus if we can. Oh, Shegun, do you have something to say? Hello? Shegun Martin, you raise your hand yeah, again. Shegun Martin, please, just a quick one. Yeah. Um, while, while Dr. Jones was responding to my uh, comments, well, a point of correction here, please. Third mainland bridge maintenance work does not mean third mainland bridge is closed. It's under partial closure. Okay. Day and night. And the maintenance work is not being done by the Chinese. Okay. Please, point of notice. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Larry sometimes listen to propaganda sometimes, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll apologize on his behalf. <laughs> right, okay, we're going to be uh, sharing, uh, I was meant to share my page with you about what we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks before, before lockdown. Okay, and uh, we have on the 12th of December, one of my colleagues, Professor Washington O'Shane, PhD, FRN, is going to be talking to us. That will be the last uh, webinar we're going to have for this year. Yeah, it's been a very, very tough year, and we've managed to uh, achieve a lot. So he's got so many topics. This guy worked with GPS. He pulls people into space. He's on transport, but the other side of transport, aircraft and all kinds of things, he's the expert in that. He's an advisor to so many uh, governments all over the world. I mean, some of the work that the Chinese are doing in terms of transportation, this is the man behind the brain of, of those work. So he hasn't fully decided on the topic here. It's giving quite a few, but I don't want to put any of them in there today. I want him to really give us something that will be very, very relevant to Africa, especially to Nigeria. He's a, he's a consultant to quite a few uh, uh, gov governors in, in Nigeria at the moment, and, uh, and I've done some work with him. So I wanted to speak on something that will be really, really relevant really to us. It's from Kenya originally. So that's it on the 12th, on the 12th of December. And on that day also, we're going to be announcing our new executive. As you know, we said to you, the current executive is, is coming to an end. And the new executive is going to be announced on that day. So please bear with us. We're, 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 we're working on that. So on that, I'm going to get Tio to uh, wrap things up. Thank you very much, Dr. Pokola, and uh, also the Dr. Uh, Larry Jones and so we want to say thank you so much for uh, a wonderful time. Uh, and I want to more or less kind of um, throw it back to all of us. Uh, we've, um, we've been very much encouraged by what Dr. Esson has been able to talk, talk, talk us through. And it's now for us to go back uh, and begin to think about uh, what next should be uh, our motives. Uh, you made a very good uh, uh, mention of the fact that Lagos State can start by setting the ball rolling. And I thank God um, we got some members who are more or less can conversant with Lagos State uh, policy here, whereby we can have engineers that can just sit down together despite the policy makers and do something like a niche for themselves. So we want to extend that hand of cooperation to every professional across board in diaspora. We can come together, we can always get in touch and see why we can work in synergy to bring this into fruition. We don't want webinars like this from Dr. Jones to go just for the fun of it and just forget about it. No, we want to put something on the table. 
and make some solid impact. And I believe these are things that we are going to see going forward from next year by the grace of God. And I believe God will help us. So in a nutshell, I want to crave for your cooperation in terms of uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, let me just use uh, Dr. Esson's um, vocab, KM, knowledge management. You know, let's come together with these ideas. Let's see what we can do to help the country. And I believe uh, we will definitely prove ourselves uh, in, our, in the show impact. So thank you very much for coming. Um, our website uh, is, is coming up very soon by, the, uh, by, by maybe by the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll be able to give you some information on that. But for the meantime, you've got some very wonderful contact information there for you to send us information about yourself, how you want to partner with us, uh, NSC London UK branch. Uh, you've got uh, the telephone number for contact, you've got the email address for contact, and then definitely you've got this WhatsApp, you've got the WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp uh, message um, forum for us to, to link together. I mean, no, no idea is too small, no idea is too big, we want to start from somewhere. Uh, and I know we've been thinking, of somebody I've been talking about getting funding, I know someone was sending something to me about, okay, yes, we have the ideas, definitely, how can we fund it? Well, definitely within the same forum, we can get people who can get us the funding. I can start from Dr. Larry Jones as a chief fundraiser there, definitely. So, <laughs> so, so don't, let, don't let us think about that, but let's get the ideas together flowing. And I believe we can get there. And um, I want to use the opportunity to say thank you for all of us that have taken time to come. Beautiful Saturday. We can sit down at home and watch football, but you have taken your time to come here. And uh, most especially, I want to say, Dr. Larry Jones, so thank you so much for an insightful uh, webinar. Uh, how I wish we were in the classroom for us to sit down and really trash issues for hours to see how we can do this. And um, uh, if anyone has any ideas, give us a shout, give us a bell, let's know exactly how to move forward. We're working together. And I believe by the time we meet again for the next webinar, keep safe and God bless. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. So that, that, that ends the, uh, the recorded part of the seminar. I'm not going to stop recording. And you, could all, you can all breathe again. And we are going to unmute everyone so we can say hello to everyone on the, on the, on the webinar. Hello. Hello. Bye. Please um, unmute yourself and let's say hello. Hello. How are you doing, Francis? Francis, Francis, how are you doing? Engineer Festus, I can